This is the ninth video in the Edexcel B3 revision tutorial series. In this video we will be looking over human evolution. We will look at how fossils and tools can be used as evidence for human evolution. We will look at the migration of modern humans and the changes in our behaviour this caused. And finally we will look at why mitochondrial DNA can be used as evidence for human evolution. You have looked at the formation of fossils previously within B2. However, fossils can be used in order to tell us or give us clues about what human ancestors were like. Our closest living relative at the moment are chimpanzees. They share about 97% of their DNA with us. Evidence from fossils suggests that we split from chimpanzees around 6 million years ago. So this would be our closest common ancestor. Humans and their ancestors are known as hominids. Throughout history there have been various different hominids. We are Homo sapiens, there have also been Homo habilis and Homo erectus, amongst a selection of others. These ancestor hominid species that we have found have characteristics that are between those of apes and of modern humans. We can look, therefore, at these hominid fossils to see how humans have evolved over time. It is important to note that when we are talking about the evolution of humans, this is only a current theory. So it's taken scientists a long time to try to discover how humans have evolved. This has led to many different theories which have come about due to the data. Sometimes data does not always support the theory, for example, a much smaller hominid was recently discovered in Indonesia, which doesn't quite fit with what we have experienced previously from the fossil record. However, sometimes data does not always prove the theory. Just because we have a theory and supporting data does not necessarily cause the theory to be true. The theory of human evolution that we are looking at in this video is the one that is currently most accepted by scientists as there is lots of data that supports this. There have been various discoveries of hominid skeletons over time that tell us about human evolution. For your GCSE you need to know about three different discoveries. The first of these was of Ardi whose skeleton dates to about 4.4 million years ago. The second is Lucy, whose skeleton dates to about 3.2 million years ago. And then finally, the studies and discoveries by Richard Leakey of various fossil hominids, whose skeletons date to 1.6 million years ago. So the first of these was the discovery of Ardi. These are the remains of Ardi that were found, and here we have an artist's reconstruction of what Ardi may have looked like. Ardi is a fossil of the species Ardipithecus ramidus. It's a female skeleton and was found in Ethiopia and is believed to date from 4.4 million years ago. As Ardi is quite an old fossil, it should be no surprise that her features are a mixture of those found in humans and chimpanzees. First of all, the structure of her feet suggests that she would have been able to climb trees. She has quite an ape-like big toe, which she would have used to grasp branches. She also has quite long arms and very short legs, which is far more like a chimpanzee than a modern human. Her brain size was also much smaller than ours and about the same size as a chimpanzee. Throughout human evolution, our brain size is something that has become massively larger. However, she is not completely like a chimpanzee. The structure of her legs suggests that she is bipedal. This means that she walks on two legs and walked upright. So she isn't using her hands to help her walk, which is something that chimpanzees need to do. Also, the bones that make up her feet suggest that she was bipedal. The second fossilised remains you need to know about are those of Lucy. Again, we have Lucy's skeleton here, as well as an artist's representation of what she may have looked like. Lucy is a fossil of the species Australopithecus afarensis. Again, the fossilised remains are of a female member of the species, and she was found in Ethiopia and is believed to date from 3.2 million years ago. 
Unlike Ardy, Lucy has arched feet. This means she's far more adapted to walking than climbing and she no longer has that ape-like big toe. The size of her arms and legs were between what you'd expect to find in chimpanzees and in humans. So her legs are starting to get longer and her arms are starting to get shorter. Her brain is slightly larger than Ardy's was, but is still very similar to the size of a chimp's brain. However, it is starting to get larger. As brain size in humans got larger, so did the size of our hips. The width of the hips got larger in order to give birth to offspring with a larger cranial size to support the larger brain. As with Ardy, Lucy's bone structure in her legs suggests that she was bipedal. However, it would also be clear that she would have not only been bipedal, but walked upright far more efficiently than Ardy would have been able to. The final fossil hominids you need to know about are those discovered by Richard Leakey. Richard Leakey, along with Mary and Louis Leakey as well, discovered many human-like fossils in Kenya. These included many fossils from different Australopithecus and Homo species. One of their finds was of Takana boy. Takana boy is a fossilised skeleton of the species Homo erectus and dates to about 1.6 million years ago. As with both Ardi and Lucy, he has similarities with both humans and chimpanzees, but he is far more human-like, as we can see here, than either Ardi or Lucy. This similarity is also seen in the artist's representation of Takana boy up here. He has much shorter arms and longer eggs, much more like a human than an ape. His brain structure is much larger than Lucy's and is actually starting to be far more similar to modern human brain size. And finally, the structure of his legs and feet suggests that he was even better adapted to walking upright than Lucy was. So apart from fossils, what other evidence is there for human evolution? The first other piece of evidence we can use comes from tools. So often when we find different homo species, we also find some of the tools they were using around the same sites. Throughout time, these tools have become far more advanced. For example, about 2.5 to 1.5 million years ago, Homo habilis was using simple pebble tools to hit stones together and make sharp flakes. These could then be used to scrape meat from bones or to crack bones open. However, when we move forward in time again to Homo erectus, these are now starting to be far more complex. They're starting to sculpt their tools, so we're getting things like simple hand axes. This time period is known as the Paleolithic Age. And it is believed that these tools were used to hunt, dig, chop down wood and continue to scrape meat from bones, but in a far more precise manner. Moving forward again, we have Homo neanderthalis. Homo neanderthalis is very closely related to Homo sapiens, and it is believed that we may have interbred with them when we came into contact with them in Northern Europe. Around this time, we start to find more complex tools again, for example, spears and flint tools. And we can see that we are now starting to combine these tools with wooden handles in order to extend their reach. Finally, we move forward again to Homo sapiens. This is when we start to find flint tools being used a lot in order to make more complex arrowheads, fish hooks, buttons and needles. These arrowheads start to appear in the Mesolithic age between 6,000 and 10,000 years ago before even more advanced tools start to appear in the Neolithic age which is 4,000 to 6,000 years ago. Whenever we find a tool from a prehistoric age we need to be able to date it to find out how old it is. We can do this in three ways. You may remember these from Edexcel B2 when you looked at fossils. The first of these is using stratigraphy. This is where we study the rock layer that the tool was found in. Older rock layers are normally found below younger layers, so tools in deeper layers are older. However, rock layers are able to move around, so this isn't always completely accurate. We can also date any fossils that have been found in the same rock and carbon date them, 
or we can carbon date any material that is found with the tool that is made from carbon, for example a wooden handle. The final piece of evidence that you need to know for GCSE is the use of mitochondrial DNA. As a recap from B2, mitochondria are found in the cell. They have small pieces of DNA inside them. This DNA is known as mitochondrial DNA or mtDNA. And it has its own genetic code separate to the nuclear DNA that is found in the nucleus. All mitochondrial DNA is inherited from the mother, so it passes down the female line. This means it does not mix with the DNA from the father. This enables scientists to use mitochondrial DNA to study human evolution, because the more different two mitochondrial DNA samples are, the further back they must share a common ancestor. From studying mitochondrial DNA, scientists found that everyone on the planet has very similar mitochondrial DNA. However, mitochondrial DNA has a very high mutation rate. This means that we have variation in the species from one person to another. This led to scientists developing a theory that we must have all descended from one woman. Scientists called her mitochondrial Eve. Scientists then went on to analyse the mutations in mitochondrial DNA across a range of people and they found out that mitochondrial Eve would have lived in Africa around 200,000 years ago. Therefore, she is also known as African Eve. It is important to note that just because we all descend from this one woman does not mean that she was the only woman around at the time. It's just that we can trace our lineage back to her. This discovery was quite groundbreaking as it provided evidence for the theory that humans originated in Africa and also meant that Homo sapiens must have evolved in Africa and then spread out around the world. Mitochondrial DNA is used in order to study human evolution instead of nuclear DNA. This is because we have lots of mitochondria in each cell, so there are lots and lots of copies of mitochondrial DNA, so it's more likely to survive. Also, mitochondrial DNA does not degrade as quickly over time as nuclear DNA does, so again, we are far more likely to find it. And finally, we use it because of that high mutation rate, which means we can trace back these mutations over time, as well as examining how closely related two members of the same species are. We can also use fossils, tools and mitochondrial DNA in order to examine human migration. So humans, it is believed, originated in Africa. And then at some point after 200,000 years ago, we started to leave. So we went into the Middle East before heading into Europe, down into East Asia, and then at some point across into the Americas as well. So why did we migrate out of Africa? Well, first of all, we would have had competition for food. There would have been a very dense population in Africa. By spreading out, it is far easier to get food. Also, the climate in Africa is very, very harsh. By migrating, we would be able to get more food. However, as we migrated out of Africa, we would have encountered lots of new environments. As we come into contact with new environments, we'd have had to have changed our behaviour to survive. For example, the food sources in coastal areas are going to be very different to those in land, as well as the very different climates, very hot in Australia and very cold in northern Europe. We'd have also have started to come across both Homo erectus and Homo neanderthalus. Therefore, the climate change would have had an effect on our behaviour. So what changes would there have been in human behaviour due to a different climate? Well, first of all, we would have had a change in our diet. We would have come across new foods. We would have had to have looked at how we would eat these as well as how to hunt them, which leads us on to different hunting methods. Depending on the food we are gathering, we are going to have to develop different hunting methods to take down different animals. Also, are we going to be getting food from trees and fish? What sort of gathering are we going to do? Remember, as a species, we are hunter-gatherers. And finally, what sort of tools are we going to need? 
as well as how are we going to clothe ourselves, what are we going to cover ourselves with in order to ensure that we survive in this new environment. We will look at three examples of these in a bit more detail. As humans migrated out of Africa, we soon found ourselves in three very different environments, in Asia, Australia and Europe. In Asia, the fossilised remains, as well as tool remains, suggest that we live predominantly near the coast. So we'd have started eating things like shellfish and other seafood. In order to eat these, we'd have had to develop new tools in order to get the shellfish out of their shells so that we could eat them. In Australia, we would have come across various different environments, including rainforests. So in the rainforest of Australia, we'd have started to eat far more fruit that was growing on the trees. Again, we'd have had to invent new tools to reach it. For example, developing tools with long handles so that we could knock the fruit out of the tree. In Europe, the climate was much, much colder and the animals that humans would have found there were a lot bigger. This meant that we'd have had to devise new methods of hunting, so we would start to hunt in groups. We'd have had to make new tools like knives and saws in order to prepare larger animals for eating. Because the climate was colder, we also had to build more shelters, and it was around this time that modern humans started to cover themselves in animal skins, especially fur, in order to make themselves warm clothes to make sure that they could survive these colder conditions. This movement into Europe was around the same time of the last ice age, which ended at the end of the Paleolithic age. An ice age is a very long period of time where the climate goes very cold and ice sheets and glaciers spread across most of the earth. Surviving the ice age was a major struggle for modern humans, which meant they had to survive in extremely cold conditions, so they became adapted to this. They built more shelters or started to seek shelter in caves. They started to use fire a lot to heat up their shelters. They continued to wear lots of skins and furs from the animals they were killing and the hunting of animals increased in order to provide food as well as these clothes. They began to make and use more tools because they were building, making clothes and hunting more. They needed more tools. And finally, it is believed that this is really where we get an explosion of language. This was required as humans needed to work together and show cooperation and communication to survive. So language developed to help groups communicate to each other as well as to pass knowledge on. This would have led to people living in larger groups and travelling shorter distances. Around this time, around 100,000 years ago, all human ancestors had dark skin, but a lighter skin colour developed as the humans moved into these colder climates with much less sun. Finally, at the end of the Ice Age, as those glaciers and ice sheets started to reduce, it is believed that humans quickly spread across the rest of Europe into Russia and may have then crossed the Bering Strait Bridge, which had been a stretch of land that joined Alaska and therefore America to Russia, which explains how humans may have reached Russia. As the ice melted, this would have caused global sea levels to rise, so the land bridge is no longer there today, as it is underneath the sea between Alaska and Russia. This is known as the Bering Strait. This concludes this video from the Edexcel B3 revision tutorial series. Within this video, we have looked at human evolution, including the evidence for evolution, as well as migration. The next video, B3.10, will move on to the final part of Edexcel B3, which is biotechnology. That video will focus on fermentation. B3.11 will then look at the uses of enzymes. And then finally, B3.12 will look at genetically modified organisms.